This has been a singular year. Not just an annoying blip waiting for self-correction, but the start of a new normal. And much like how our lives are changing, the way we view movies is as well. The steady stream of blockbusters has stopped short of a trickle, rendering early 2020 watch lists laughably outdated. But a small inconvenience in the grand scheme of things. In their absence, it has caused a peculiar leveling of the playing field, giving smaller movies a chance to find an audience they would have otherwise never had. Interesting gems we are grateful to find during these uncertain times. Gems that shouldn't go unnoticed. In today's video, I present to you my list of my favorite movies of 2020. Some are more popular and others are lesser known, but all of them I recommend and have enjoyed or appreciated on different levels. It's an unranked top 10 list, but I've divided them into three categories. Three reoccurring patterns of the realities the characters of the stories have to face. And in the mix, we'll present this channel's top viewers' choice selections. This is a spoiler-free list, but keep in mind I will show clips and give a short synopsis. Also, this end-of-the-year video is brought to you by Surfshark, but more on them later. In this category, we find movies about characters facing a harsh reality. They offer a more gritty, unfiltered, sobering look into someone else's perspective, regardless of setting, gender, or cultural context, even if they find themselves in the early 19th century. History isn't here yet. It's coming, but we got here early this time. First Cow is a tale of two characters trying to find their place in a new frontier gaining success by being the only ones able to sell baked goods in a real food desert. I taste London in this game. But they only achieve this by stealing milk from the first cow that has arrived in the area. A very calm breeze of a movie that moves at an unhurried pace, not offering a romanticized view of the past, yet it manages to be a warm portrait about friendship and frontier resilience. A refreshing slice of life that represents the many early American dreams that have been forgotten and gone untold. Another story that shines by its minimalism is The Assistant. But unlike the previous entry, there is no warmth to be found here. There is a coldness in the look and sound of the movie that is magnified by its extremely focused perspective. We follow Jane for a full day, from dreary morning to exhausting late night, working as one of the assistants of a Harvey Weinstein type movie producer. We see her drone along as she must juggle her demanding work with her growing inner struggle of the office's well-known secret. What makes this movie special is how it handles its troubling subject matter. It never says it out loud, but its effects permeate the frame much like the movie's antagonist. He remains almost hidden, and because of this, it somehow gives him more power, like an omnipresent entity that needs to be pleased and kept happy, enabled by people looking for its affirmation. It was not my place to question your decisions. Yeah, good, that's good. The aptly named Jane represents any woman silenced in the face of systemic abuse of power, caught between going against the cycle or having to aid it. The following dose of realism can be found in the bleak dousing of cold water that is never, rarely, sometimes, always. I saw you weren't at school today. I went to the doctor. What's wrong? Real problems? The female perspective is put in full display with the silent desperation of young Autumn dealing with her unwanted pregnancy. She travels all the way to New York with her cousin to get the medical attention she couldn't receive back home. They both try to maneuver this complex issue by themselves, which is made even more difficult by the constant obstacles they discover along the way. It's Autumn's tense, long journey to find some agency. You get the feeling she's even keeping the audience at a certain distance as a defense mechanism. I'm gonna ask you some questions. They can be really personal, and all you have to do is answer either never, rarely, sometimes, or always. It's kinda like... A teenager refusing to crack from the weight of adversity, but when she does, we break with her. We're not meant to agree with all her decisions, but by the end, you can't help but understand some of her pain. Our next desperate character is trying to hold on to his sanity. Ah! Ah! 
In Sound of Metal, a heavy metal drummer is rapidly losing his hearing and is forced to come to terms with the reality that his life is about to change. A character study of a recovering drug addict with a troubled past whose lifeline and passion are about to be taken away. And over the next few days, or even hours, it's going to continue. And the hearing that you have lost is not coming back. He has to balance surpassing his disability, or worse, learning to live with it. How can he accept this world of silence if he can't live with the noise inside of himself? Riz Ahmed delivers a career-propelling role capturing the fear and urgency of a man on thin ice. His range of emotions, from furious outbursts to quiet indignation, is put in full display and deserving of praise. The movie's sound design efforts to put us in his state of mind should be commended as well. And it's also a top viewer's choice. Riz Ahmed has cemented himself as one of the more prolific actors working today. In Sound of Metal, you completely forget it's him. The last one in this category is a son. A Taiwanese drama of a family hit by a succession of unfortunate events, starting when the youngest son is put in juvenile detention after a brutal attack. A great movie that has everything working against it. A long runtime, slow burn atmosphere, tonal shifts every other 30 minutes, contradictory soundtrack, and yet you can't seem to stop watching. It's an odd movie that I can only compare it with the quiet, simmering intensity of the recent Korean film Burning and shares its poetic feel. A fracturing family taken by the relentless nature of life while having to stomach grief. It walks the line of almost being surreal, much like how misfortune knocks you out of the reality you know. You might wonder where it's all going, but trust me, it's quite a ride. These are all great stories of characters left with little choice, much like in our world when confronting a harsh reality, you either learn to surpass it or learn to accept it. Although reality can seem to have a limit when we're facing something that feels so outside the norm, causing an emotion we can't quite put into words, finding ourselves in the realm of the bizarre, the unnatural, and the surreal, like in the ever-changing mosaic of the uncanny in La Casa Lobo. Tengo de la colonia. Afuera. Spoken in German and broken Spanish, it's a nightmarish stop-motion tale of young Maria that has recently escaped her colony and finds refuge in an empty house in the woods. The story is based on a real horror of a German sect that used to be in the south of Chile, where child abuse and political prison torture took place. It's presented by an unreliable narrator as a cautionary tale for those who wish to leave the settlement. Como pastor de esta comunidad, Espero ayudar a disipar los horribles rumores que han enlodado nuestra reputación. A dark fable of control and oppression. The breaking down and reshaping of 2D animation and 3D objects show a manipulated reality and the main character's traumatized psyche. This prolonged mutation is both impressive and very unsettling. Moving on to another movie with a well-provisioned WTF supply is the Brazilian neo-western Bacurau. The inhabitants of a remote village in a dystopian Brazil have gathered after the loss of their matriarch. They are a very tight-knit community that is just getting by. One day, they start noticing odd occurrences like the disappearance of their town from the map and drop phone signals. They soon realize the presence of an invading outside force that they now must defend themselves from. When this movie was asked what genre it wanted to be, it simply replied yes and took all of them. It's an absurd, grungy, violent, and slightly unhinged manifestation of a dormant anti-colonial rage. It's out there, and it wants to stay out there. I have to admit, I enjoyed this at a primal level. Shifting gears from the visceral surreal to the psychological, we see Charlie Kaufman's loose adaptation of the novel I'm Thinking of Ending Things by Ian Reid. I'm thinking of ending things. Huh? What? Did you say something? No, I don't think so. Lucy is going on a trip with her new boyfriend, Jake, to visit his parents at his boyhood home. While in the background, she keeps entertaining the thought of ending their relationship. 
At first, the movie seems just a tad awkward, then weird. And maybe some light spoilers here. As it progresses, it gets worse. We notice more drastic changes in time, place, tone, genre, character perspective. We're definitely not on solid ground here. This is Charlie Kaufman exploring his most malleable narrative yet. Hey, who is this? You can't tell. It's me. No, it was me. Wasn't it me? The story is at times confusing and off-putting, but ultimately, it's an introspective, surreal trip and a half that leaves you with plenty of self-rumination. Melancholic at times, but I wouldn't say bleak. A dreamlike conflation of fantasy and reality, and the character's difficulty of being anchored by the latter. Also, it's a top viewer's choice. I'm thinking of ending things is my favorite of the year. Its mysterious nature is so beautifully enigmatic to me that, even though I can't fully comprehend it, I love it. It's a strange year for film, and for everything else, but at least Charlie Kaufman's getting work. As some characters struggle to deal with the changing reality, we also find stories of people finding ways to escape it, like in the sprawling cinematic indulgence of Mank. Herman Mankiewicz, New York playwright and drama critic, turned humble screenwriter, Mr. Hurst. Why? No need to be humble, Mr. Mankiewicz. A movie that might be guilty of being too witty for its own good, just like its main character. This is the story of how Herman Mankiewicz rushed to write the screenplay for Citizen Kane, and using it as an outlet to air out his grievances against the state of old Hollywood. The director David Fincher is almost unrecognizable here, as one would be forgiven to mistake this with a Coen Brothers movie, a tribute perhaps not to old Hollywood, but to his late father's script. You cannot capture a man's entire life in two hours. All you can hope is to leave the impression of one. It's a stylized, well-written, sharp repartee of tongue-in-cheek dialogue that hides its insults in effective, well-worded, and more damaging replies from characters that don't ever seem to suffer from l'esprit de l'escalier. Perhaps some people might not like this artifice, but I especially enjoy it. And on top of that, it's a movie about making movies. They got me hook, line, and sinker. And it's another viewer's choice. Even as the discourse around who is responsible for the script behind the greatest film of all time remains contentious, Fincher's film doesn't seek to address that debate or give it a definitive answer. No, Fincher cares Mank finally does something that he feels he can put his name on, and cares even more that it's something he chooses to fight for. The next coping mechanism can be found in the Danish dramedy Another Round. Just that clearly. You feel like the word? That we were young, Yeah. We find four high school teachers in the midst of their midlife crisis, wondering where things went wrong. One of them offhandedly introduces the theory of a Norwegian psychiatrist that says humans have an alcohol deficit of 0.05% in their blood. They decide to experiment with this theory, to observe if their lives can be enriched by being functionally drunk. But it's like Hemingway. We drink only after 8, and not weekend. In the process, they surprisingly start to rediscover their youthful zeal, pushing the limits of their inhibition. It's an exploration of Danish drinking culture and finding the right balance in life. It's not a movie that's trying to change the world, more like an enjoyable hangout. Funny without being absurd with its concept and serious without being melodramatic or judgmental. And topped off with a softer, more insecure side of Mads Mikkelsen, showing us a hidden talent we didn't know we needed to see. It invites you to celebrate what you have rather than focus on what you don't. It's a real treat. Before I leave you with my last pick, here are a few viewers' choices that we didn't get to mention. Wolfwalkers. It is a much welcome breath of fresh air in animation. The visuals, the soundtrack, the likability of the characters, and the soul of the film. Everything works so well to make this my favorite of the year. The Five Bloods. I can already smell the Academy snubbing that masterpiece. One word. Possessor. Palm Springs is my personal favorite of the year. I'm really surprised the writer still can make this overused concept feel fresh again. Heart. Tenet, an absolutely mind-bending experience, in IMAX no less. I haven't seen a lot of movies this year, but the one that leaves a lasting impression, I think is House of Hummingbird. The fact that it was made, the story about a young girl in a patriarchal family, in this society, is already big. And it was done really well with all the nuance. I am really grateful that the director has given a language to that experience that we went through. Something that I thought I should just forget and put up with. My favorite film from this year is Steve McQueen's Mangrove. McQueen is constantly releasing, then restraining. Inflating, then deflating. Accelerating, then breaking. The immense power of the film ultimately lies in its immense patience. 
and the top viewer's choice was The Invisible Man. The Invisible Man had me nervous for days. Hard to beat that. Finally, the last movie on my list just squeezed in at the 11th hour as I was editing this video, turning this list into a top 11 and somehow becoming my favorite movie of 2020, Pixar's Soul. The damn thing made me tear up. Dorothea Williams, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Congratulations, man. Wow, I would die a happy man if I could perform with Dorothea Williams. Oh, well, this could be a lucky day. Soul is the story of Joe Gardner, a part-time middle school band teacher frustrated by his inability to fulfill his passion of being a jazz pianist. On the day he finally gets his shot, he meets an untimely death that brings him to the great before. No, 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 listen, I have a gig tonight. I can't die now. <laughs> well, I really don't think you have a lot to say about this. Yes, yes. He is now stuck trying to find a way back to his body and to his long-awaited gig. This story is for anyone waiting for their life to start. I don't think this is for children, not that they can't enjoy it, but I feel the more years you've lived on this earth, the more it makes you appreciate the story, especially if you ever felt like a lost soul at any point in your journey. This is why we have animation, not only to imitate reality, but to expand on it and to help explain it. This feels like it was cut from the same cloth as Inside Out, visually exploring the abstract concept of existentialism and our hard to pin down emotions about purpose and yearning. They've managed to capture their essence and evoke a beautiful, warm, timeless, cathartic trip. A comfort for lost souls. A story about death to teach us about living. Maybe in an alternate universe, my choice would have been Denis Villeneuve's Dune or Wes Anderson's The French Dispatch. But since this has been a banner year for the weird and devastating, we try to find our comforts where we can. And this was especially comforting. These days, even the most realistic movies present a reality that we no longer have access to. Whenever on-screen characters are in a group or simply shaking hands, I feel an odd phantom pain of what once was. Films are still in a sort of limbo of an alternate world, and soon that timeline will catch up and merge with ours. The fantasy will reflect our reality, whatever that may look like. But for now, movies are a welcomed escape, as we learn to accept what comes next. Thank you for watching our video, and we'll see you in 2021. Our next video is going to be about the best horror movies of 2020, so make sure you're notified for that. Now, if you're wondering how we watch certain movies, well, you might be interested in getting a VPN like the one we use from Surfshark. Not only does it give you access to a lot of content from streaming services that would otherwise remain geolocked in other countries, but most importantly, it protects your information by encrypting all the data that you send through the internet and where you're connecting from, keeping unwanted prying eyes away, and adding to that peace of mind, even they don't log your information. There are a lot of VPNs out there, but we prefer using Surfshark because it's one of the fastest, well-reviewed, and most affordable. It offers a slew of features. Not only does it work across all platforms, but you're not limited to the number of devices you can install it on. Use Surfshark Alert that lets you know if your information appears in a leaked database, or Surfshark Search to prevent ads or trackers to follow your searches. I could go on, but I recommend you look it up on your own. Go to surfshark.deals screened. If you use our promo code screened, you'll get 84% off the regular price, which means for something like a couple of bucks a month, you can be fully protected. Plus, you'll get four months for free. Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so if you try it and don't like it, you can simply cancel your subscription and get your money back. Again, go to the link in the description, surfshark.deals slash screened. It was a pleasure making these video essays and talking with everyone in the comments. Next year, we have something very interesting in mind for the channel with the start of a film club, but more on that later on. Happy New Year and don't forget to leave a like, subscribe and share with a friend. Until next time.